الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن استنى بسنته بإحسان يوم الدين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتد لولا أن هدانا الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome you to another session from the commentary in the 40 hadith of Al-Imam Al-Nawi's collection of Arba'in and with the fadl of Allah we have reached hadith number 27 and let us begin Al-Nawas bin Sam'an radiyan anna al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal al-birru husnu al-khuluq wal-ithmu ma haqa fi nafsik wa karahta an yattali'a alayhi al-nas rawahu muslim wa an wabisa bin ma'bad radiyan qal ataytu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam faqal jitta tas'alu an al-bir qult na'am faqal استفتي قلبك البر ما اطمأنت إليه النفس واطمأن إليه القلب والإثم ما حاك في نفسه وتردد في الصدر وإن أفتاك الناس وافتوك حديث حسن رويناه في مسند إمامين أحمد بن حنبل والدارمي بإسناد حسن النواس بن سمعان ودعان report the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said Righteousness is good character and sin is that which wavers in your heart and which you do not want people to know about. Muslim. And as per Wabisa, Bil Ma'bad, who said, I came to the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and he said, You have come to ask me about righteousness? I answered, Yes. He said, Consult your heart. Righteousness is that about which the soul feels tranquil and the heart feels tranquil. And sin is that which creates restlessness in the soul and moves to and from the breast, even though people give you their verdict and continue to give you their verdict. And this is, as per Imam Nawi, a good hadith transmitted from the uh, Musnadain of the two Imams, Ahmad bin Hanbal and Imam al-Darimi. As is our tradition, let us go into the lives of the narrators. And now is our tradition that we're going to go into the two narrators of this hadith, Ya'ani will discuss a few brief points regarding their life. And they're not well known. The first narrator of this hadith is An Nawas bin Sam'an. And his lineage, he was a Kilabi. And his father was part of a delegation to meet the Prophet. Okay. And this Sahabi, he narrates actually a few hadith or several hadith, and he actually had many students, including the famous Zahid uh, Abu Idris al Khawani. Okay. And both Imam Muslim and Imam Bukhari and many other muhaddithin also narrate hadith from the Sahabi Al Nawas bin Sam'an. And the next Sahabi who narrates the second version of this hadith is Wabisa bin Ma'bad. Okay. And he was from the delegation from Banu Asad in the ninth year of Hijrah. A famous story which is known regarding the Sahabi was that he prayed behind the Prophet ﷺ and he prayed actually in a separate line away from the Sahaba. And the Prophet ﷺ commanded him to pray again because he prayed separately from the Jama'ah. Okay, again, nice few wisdoms and for whatever reason he felt that he could pray separately. Okay. Anyway, he, the Sahabi lived a short period and he was known for asking the Prophet a lot of questions. Yet he was very keen in observing the Prophet Wabisa bin Ma'bad had five sons. He would read the Quran excessively and he would be known to not have control of his tears. He would have a mushaf with him much of the time and the pages often would be read because of his tears and the frequent crying of Fi Sabilillah. He uh, Rada'an moved to Kufa and then to Raqqa where he passed away, Rada'an Huma. So next, let's talk about the Sanad of the Hadith. Since this course is about Hadith, let's briefly talk about a technical point 
about this hadith, specifically the second hadith. But this actually will be needed since, you know, we're going to go into a couple more of a hadith from this collection in the near future, which actually are on the weak side. Any hadith which are weak. Of course, the first hadith from this collection, or the first hadith regarding hadith number 27, is in Sahih Muslim, so there's no question about its authenticity. The first thing which should be pointed out is that the second hadith on its own is da'if or weak. But due to supporting evidence, it has been raised to the level of Hassan. Here we see that a weak hadith can actually be raised to an authentic hadith if there is supporting proof, such as from another narration as per a muhaddith. And this is called Hassan li ghayrihi. This actually means that it's Hassan because of something outside it or independent of the hadith itself. If something else has made it Hassan. In general, we can categorize hadith into many different categories. But in terms of authenticity, there are only two categories which they can be put into. Uh, those which are sahih, those which are authentic, and those which are not authentic. So authentic hadith have actually two gradings. So an authentic hadith can either be Hassan or Sahih. Sahih is the cream of the crop. Everything about the hadith is top notch. It is the gold hadith. Everything beyond that, like we could say the silver class or the bronze class is Hassan. But regardless, both Hassan and Sahih hadith, they're equal in terms of Sharia. Both are can be used to give a verdict basically. Okay. A weak hadith in general cannot be used as evidence for a fatwa or evidence for an injunction from the sharia in general. Okay. So a weak hadith can be elevated to only hasan but not to sahih status. Okay. Also please note that depending on the muhadith there can be varying opinions also on a hadith whether it's authentic or weak. Okay. So there are different gradings by muhadithin as well. Okay. And also you should note that According to the Muhaddithun, even though there are various ways of classifying a hadith, they are put into one of two categories, either authentic or not authentic. So the weak hadith are actually grouped with the fabricated or false hadith. And sometimes the weak hadith can even be declassified as batil depending on the Muhaddith who is evaluating the hadith, per se. So it's important that we have an idea about the weak hadith as well, along with the authentic hadith and have some notion of it. And you have to understand that in general, looking at the total number of hadith out there, most of them actually are categorized as da'if or weak. So most hadith that we have in terms of what's out there, they are weak hadith. So we have to be a little careful because in general, the rulings of what's prohibited, what's Obligatory, all those things are dependent on the authentic, the Hassan or the Sahih Hadith. And remember that some Muhaddithun, they can upgrade a weak Hadith to be into the Hassan category as well. And that is okay. And that obviously requires the input and the experience and the knowledge of a Muhaddith, someone who is very familiar with the Hadith. So going forward. Okay. So the Prophet says, Al birru husnul khuluq in the first hadith. And regarding bir, he also says, Al birru matma'annat ilayhi nafs. Watma'anna ilayhi qalb. Okay, so these two hadith state the meaning of righteousness and also of ithm or sin. So looking at explain the shara of this hadith, recall that this hadith also, this hadith regarding al bir was also used in the discussion where the Prophet ﷺ said in hadith number 12, Da'ma yuribuk ila ma la yuribuk. Leave that which you have doubt about to that which you do not have doubt about. So doubt is an important part also regarding the meaning of this hadith. Okay. And Imam Ibn Rajab rahimahullah states that the term bir, the word bir in this hadith is actually used in two different aspects. Number one, all acts of good deeds and worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay, number one. And remember our discussion. Recall the discussion of the vertical relationship and the horizontal relationship. Acts which are relative only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then also acts to 
our fellow human beings as well, which is the horizontal relationship. So based on the first statement, al-birru husnul khuluq, al-birru husnul khuluq, the most important aspect of righteousness in every individual is that of good character or akhlaq. Ibn Rajab goes to further say that this stems from all good manners and deeds as mentioned from the Qur'an al Karim. So bir is of different types. There is one which is between a person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through their iman, through performing the obligations and also refraining from the prohibitions of Allah. And there is number two, the horizontal relationship between a person and other people. And this revolves again around khuluq or character. So you have the vertical relationship between a person and Allah, the righteousness of this person in terms of his ibadat. And also we have a person who establishes and fulfills the horizontal relationship, hukukul ibad. He fulfills that by husnul khuluq, excellent character. Okay. And khuluq, good character, can also be subdivided as well into three categories which are number one, khuluq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Then it's khuluq with others and also good character with oneself. Well, this shows that a person who doesn't fast or pray cannot be a person who has good khuluq, even if he displays excellent manners with others. Rather, he has to fulfill obligations and refrain from the prohibitions as well as to display character with others. If someone's not fulfilling their obligations or their khuluq with Allah, how can they be considered to have good character? Altogether, you have to be well-rounded. You cannot be deficient in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time. You cannot have deficiencies in terms of your obligations to your fellow human beings or your brother or sister in Islam. So again, the establishing and fulfilling the vertical relationship first and also uh, completing the horizontal relationship. And this involves husnul khuluq. I mean, how can we improve our khuluq or character? Is it something which can just happen overnight or in a week or in a month? No, it's a long-term effort. And there are four main ways in which we can uh, increase and build good character. And these are long-term efforts. So number one, we have to study and implement the Qur'an and the Sunnah. These are our two lifelines. The raft in the waves of fitna. These two sources show us exactly what the best character is. It's important and also to implement them in our lives daily. Number two, to be in the company of those with excellent character. Being in the company of excellent people, those with excellent character, it will rub off on us, inshallah. And the most common example of this is being raised in a household where there's good mannerisms taught by our parents okay, or those around us. So when you're in a household where there's excellent character, it will rub off on you and you will be affected. And this is really so effective, so effective. You, know, you wonder how those kids have such good character and they have such a great disposition, it's look at the parents, look at where they're living. Often that's the answer. And this is not that easy. It takes a lot of effort from us, the parents as well. We need to, inshallah, continue to strive and do jihad and uh, make our houses the bedrock for excellent character, husnul khuluq, inshallah. To do good actions, charity, practice patience, restrain anger and be humble. All these actions are essential in terms of establishing that excellent character. The principles are empty without any action. And lastly, to reflect and learn the lessons from the life and the character of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. He is the best example. And the Aisha, which asked about the Prophet Wasallam, she said, Kana Quran. His character was the Qur'an. He was the exemplification, the living Qur'an, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. Then the Prophet, sallallahu in the second hadith, he says, قَالْ أَتَيْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَقَالْ جَأْتَ تَسْأَلُ عَنِ الْبِرِ قُلْتُ نَعَمْ فَقَالْ إِسْتَحْتِ قَلْبَكْ Consult your heart. الْبِرُّ مَتْمَأَنَّتْ إِلَيْهِ النَّفْسِ وَتْمَأَنَّ إِلَيْهِ الْقَلْبِ Wabisa said, I came to the Messenger of Allah and he said, 
You have come to ask me about righteousness and I answered yes. He said, Istafte kalbak, consult your heart. Righteousness is that about which the soul feels tranquil. Matma'annat ilayhi nafs. Watma'anna ilayhi al-qalb. And the heart feels tranquil. So here the second hadith narrated by Wabisa recommends us to consult our hearts with respect to doubtful matters. Okay. Remember doubtful matters in hadith number 12, right? Doubt is something we need to remove because it, our heart cannot take it and it's agitated. Okay. So if the heart is tranquil, this implies that the action is one of bear or righteousness. This is an automatic reaction. It is natural to be righteous. On the other hand, if the heart is not tranquil, then one should abstain from carrying out that act because it is likely ithm or sinful. And the Prophet says, وَالْإِثْمُ مَحَاقَ فِي نَفْسِكَ وَتَرَدَّدَ فِي الصَّدْرُ وَإِنْ أَفْتَاكَ النَّاسُ وَأَفْتَوْكَ And sin is that which creates restlessness in the soul and moves to and from the breast even though people give you their verdict and continue to give you their verdict. So sin is that what causes your soul, your nafs, to waver and tremble. And this second part of the hadith defines this act, the sinful act, for which its performer or the one who performs it feels blame or uneasiness. This is a natural reaction from our fitrah, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in. Well, thus this hadith gives us a very important sign. The sign of sin. Okay, this is an automatic internal reaction. This sign occurs because the person is naturally disposed to favor the good, the truthful actions. That, those things which are good. And the first sign of sin is internal and occurs deep within the human being when performing it. One may not even note it. But internally there's a reaction which happens. For example... Like lying. Why is there the lie detector test? Right? Why is there a lie detector test? You may not note it externally that the person is lying. But internally there's a reaction which happens. The lie detector detects that lie even though the person may be a bad person. Okay? This is evidence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in righteousness. We were born telling the truth. We were born doing good deeds. But it is our environment with these changes. It is our parents who may have told us to do evil things, such as, for example, adopt a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or be disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Furthermore, the second sign is external. The second sign of sinning is external. It is an outward feeling and a reaction of committing these sinful acts. So after sin, you often have a feeling of shame and this is natural as well. So there's an internal reaction and also there external reaction. So it's unnatural for a person to do actions which are evil. So it is your nature to do good deeds, to worship the one and only Allah, to tell the truth. Islam is against that concept that we were born in sin. This is not an Islamic concept. We were born in righteousness. We were born telling the truth. We were born doing tawheed. Okay. So altogether sin causes the soul to be uneasy and troubled. It becomes unhappy. It becomes worried because of the internal reaction, the internal control system which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created us with the fitrah. And this was discussed in depth in hadith number 4 and also in, here and there piecemeal in the different hadith commentary that we've gone through. Our fitrah is to love the truth, love good and hate falsehood and evil. The mu'minun, the believers with the pure fitra are the ones who do not confuse the truth with the falsehood. Okay. And this hadith elaborates on this internal control system which is within us. It is actually composed of several different things which allow it to guide us. And we've talked about these, we're just going to review them. And these include number one, the fitra, okay, which we were created with. Okay. Number two, the realization of tawheed. This is also within our fitra, to believe in one God without partners, you know, to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to seek His help when we are in need, to have tawakkul, to also seek His mercy. Number three, to adhere to the sharia. Remember, the sharia has evolved from the time of Adam al Islam until now, into the final solidification of, the, of, of Islam, 
and completed by the Prophet of Muhammad Sallallahu However, many of the injunctions of the Sharia were found in the former books as we have seen. Ten Commandments, for example. So the Sharia also is part of the internal control system. And number four, which is very important, is seeking knowledge. Okay, seeking knowledge. And we're going to shortly see how important this is in terms of maintaining the internal control system. And another similar part is Tazkiyah and Tarbiyah. Self-purification and also developing and training and molding you know, our character in ourselves. Okay. So by knowledge and also Tazkiyah and Tarbiyah, this is the purification of the soul and the heart of the believer. So the above mentioned factors are all interrelated and together form the internal control system defined by this hadith. However, this internal system within us needs to be regularly tuned up. I'm going to go to something which Imam Siraj Bahaj mentioned in one speech, which still echoes in my mind and it's very fresh, even though he spoke about it like 20 years ago, subhanAllah. And he had a speech which was, fix your alternator. Why is the alternator so important for the car? You start the car with the battery and it keeps it going. And the thing which keeps recharging the battery and prevents it from dying is the alternator. So without the alternator, the battery would just, the level of energy would just go low. So our battery is our iman and we need to make sure that our alternator is good. And what is our alternator? Okay, what is our alternator? Our alternator is knowledge or ilm. These are the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us. This is the primary sources of guidance, the Qur'an, the Sunnah. Without these, our battery would easily and quickly go too low. We need to continuously keep our battery high and at a functional level. And this is what the Salah does. This is what the Qur'an and the Sunnah do as well. Similarly, when we attend a speech, a seminar, um, this is what gives us fuel, keeps our alternator working properly. This is the ilm. This is the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this allows us to clarify the good from the bad and also keep away from the influences of the shaitan, etc. Similarly, tazkiyah and tarbiyah are important also in terms of that car wash. So in addition to the ilm, we also need to purify ourselves and also to have tarbiyah for the self. Otherwise, things will get rusty. The car will become dirty from the outside. So we have to continuously cleanse our heart as well. And this is what happens when we do dhikr. When we do these sincere ibadah that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about. And no one else knows about. Because we're doing all this. We're living life for Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only created us that we can worship Him. Okay. So tazkiyah, tarbiyah for that self-purification. Ilm, knowledge of the Quran, sunnah and other related sciences to keep our alternator firm and recharge our batteries on a daily, continuous basis. So this internal control system is essential for us to make sure that our heart stays fit and that we do not lose the goodness which is within us in terms of our heart. Okay, when the heart becomes corrupted, then everything goes berserk, everything turns upside down. Those people who have corrupted minds or hearts then they like to sin and they hate to do good deeds. So we need to be aware about our important role in terms of keeping the internal control system operating optimally. Okay? To do the tune-ups that we need to do in ourselves from ilm, from tazkiyah, from tarbiyah, insha'Allah. We're responsible for that. We're responsible for the maintenance of the nafs, of the qalb, of our minds as well. We should use traditional and also contemporary approaches for tazkiyah and tarbiyah for our maintenance. And the ulama, the educators, our teachers and du'at also have an important role in that regard. You know, they should not just use the traditional method. You know, they should not just limit themselves to the opinion of a single scholar or a single religious group or school of thought regarding the matters of tazkiyah, purification, or tarbiyah, which is development. Okay. Thus, we need to use the most suitable approach for the challenges of our time, but should still benefit from the traditional approaches as well. So then we have the corruption of the fitrah. So the fitrah is subject to corruption and can be spoiled to the influence of 
a bad environment. The Prophet ﷺ said, "My yuladu, an infant is born according to his nature. It is his parents who make him a Jew, a Christian, just as a she camel gives birth to his young ones. Do you find any deficiency in the limbs? You cut their ears after birth." And this is there by Abu Huraira in Sahih Muslim. So thus by the environment, especially one's family, has an essential impact on one's fitrah. Most of those that end up Muslim by name were not in a household where their parents taught them the proper Islam. Islam was not a priority. It was just like culture. And not a life and death issue as it is. The prayer was not stressed or made equal to the academic school or work. And when this happens, one's Islam is likely to be subservient. A person can only have one goal in life. Strive for the akhirah or the dunya. You can only have one love. right? It's either for the akhirah or the dunya. So one's fitrah can be influenced to the extent that a person may even start to like the evil and dislike the good. So here the heart becomes diseased and is in a state of dying. Because such a person cannot use his heart in terms of this hadith to guide them in terms of what is good or bad because they're already their heart is diseased. Okay. So here the fitrah becomes or has become corrupt. May Allah protect us from that. And so the Prophet ﷺ, he continues in this discussion on sin. And sin is what creates restlessness in the soul and moves to and from the breast, even though people give you their verdict and continue to give you their verdict. So perhaps you may ask a person about a matter and he tells you it's okay, but your heart still wavers and has doubt. So here, if the person you ask is indeed qualified in the deen, like for example, faqih or alim or a mufti, and he brings you the proof of the Quran and Sunnah, then that doubt should be eliminated. However, if you just ask the average Joe or average Abdullah, then this opinion regarding a matter is actually something false because your heart still, you're still asking others because there's something in your heart which is propelling you to, you're not certain, you have doubt. Okay. But another possibility perhaps is that the fatwa that you were given is incorrect even though it was by a scholar, whether it was related to incorrect ishtihad or faulty knowledge, then the situation can be there and you can have a resultant restlessness in your nafs. And another situation is that there are legitimate differences of opinion and that you should go with the one that you think is best. And we discussed this in depth as well. So this really is not doubt, it's just an ikhtilafi thing. And here you make your ijtihad in terms of what you think is best because at the end of the day, it's you who decides what opinion is best. Okay, the ball is in your court. So you should go with the one which you are at most ease with. And it's also important today, I mean, there's many contemporary matters where we Muslims have doubt in you know, with regards to permissibility, halal or haram, and these include insurance, like the whole topic of halal meat, medicine, trade or technology. And for these, you should seek opinion of those who are the most qualified and also have their supporting proof for future reference because they also should give you the proof in the Quran and Sunnah because in case you want to study it more further. So you should not just ask the local imam for something which requires a really expert, high-level opinion. Because they're going to give you the opinion based on their knowledge, i.e. their limited knowledge. And that's what you're going to get. So putting everything together, highlights from this beautiful hadith. So these two ahadith from hadith number 27 elaborate on the internal control which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has endowed all of us with. And it is a sense within us which allows us to discern between the good and the evil, specifically between righteous and sinful actions. And for the sincere believer, his heart will naturally react to evil with uneasiness and doubt. On the contrary, it will react with tranquility and ease when performing the good. Okay. Furthermore, righteousness is also reflected through one's character and attitude as well. And it is important to remember that all Muslims, including the sincere believers, need tazkiyah and tarbiyah for their internal purification and spiritual growth. Also, they need ilm, which is like the alternator of a car which charges our battery and prevents it from failing. Without this, one's internal control system and fitra will not be able to allow us to properly discern between good and evil. And this is because evil influences from our environment and people around us can 
corrupt our fitrah. And lastly, within globalization and the proliferation of the internet, it is essential for us to deal with the new challenges and dilemmas which are ahead of us. Okay, this will keep us, inshallah, away from evil and prevent us from committing the haram. Okay, may Allah give us the full tawfiq in allowing us to apply these hadith in our lives. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik wa nashhadu wa la ila illa ant wa sakta kutubu wa ilayka assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.